Good morning, sir. Hey, good morning. Bala here. Good morning, Bala. So we'll be putting our everybody mute uh, till we join. I'm just giving a couple of minutes uh, early so everybody can join in time. Nice background, sir. Swamiji's picture. Well, uh, join so far. We have 46 people. Excellent. Okay, good. So, good morning and good afternoon, good evening to all of you. So, this is a Hari Panapali. I'm a alumni ambassador for the JNTU Hyderabad College of Engineering. So this is the first of its kind. We wanted to uh, conduct this webinar to support and help people during this uh, COVID crisis. And we'll be continuing to offer more webinars uh, moving forward on the jobs and immigration and various other topics. So we are kind enough to have um, the doctors, Dr. Madhuri, who is in the front line serving the COVID patients in New York City and also Dr. Shanti Ipnapali, who is a pain management specialist from New Jersey, and Dr. Madhavi from Hyderabad, who is managing a 200-bedded hospital in Hyderabad, directly the COVID patients. Then we have uh, uh, Rector Govardhan from JNTU Hyderabad, uh, who is kind enough to join us today. He's going to share about how to get admissions in India in the engineering colleges in case some of our fellow H1 holders or anybody wants to return back to India. Then we also have uh, our uh, immigration attorney from Washington DC, Janeta Kancharla. She's kind enough to join us to provide an update on the recent uh, executive order from President Trump on the immigration bill, as well as um, the impact of uh, COVID and unemployment for H1 holders, what they can do and how they can manage to stay back in the country. Any questions that you may have, she will be happy to answer. Then we have uh, Swami, who is also a JNT alumni from North Carolina, who is the CIO of InfoAmerica, who is kind enough to host this session for us. And uh, I will be coming back to you towards the end of the session one more time. But our goal is to bring all our JNT alumni together and collectively service the society in this need of the hour and whatever way we can. Uh, whether it could be employment or healthcare or education. So anything that we can serve, that's the purpose of this to bring them together. So back to you, Swami. Yeah, thank you, Hariji. Again, as Hariji said, uh, this is a fantastic event, uh, first of its kind in uh, JNTU alumni. But unfortunately, we have to start this session at this pandemic uh, situation. But as we all know that United, we all can work together to come out of this crisis. And first and foremost, uh, all the doctors, what we call are the real firefighters and the angels of the world. You know, you are really helping everybody. We are still worrying about staying home and uh, we are still feeling 
how it we, are, we can be escaping from it but you guys are really facing every day so without further ado i have put an agenda so first we'll be talking to the doctors from the us and then india and then there will be a q and a session to them then we'll be talking to our janita ji attorney so that we can all talk about what is the impact on immigration visas and all as arjee mentioned and then uh, we will be going to our um, uh rector govardhan ji so that there are a lot of people who have got affected here their families are going back to india so the kids uh, how they can enter into the colleges so we will ask everybody whoever i am calling the names in an order so please introduce and then talk about your things and then um, i will again mute yourself and then i will call so right now the order we will be going with uh, dr madhuri ji from new york she is our front line firefighter an angel in new york uh dr madhuri ji over to you so please unmute and if you need to share anything share and everybody else i am muting if you are not muted please mute yourself thank you madhuri ji go ahead uh hi everyone thank you so much first of all for inviting me to educate you uh i am an infectious diseases specialist i'm almost done with my training in new york um and i'll be sharing a little bit about um actually a lot of the questions that i've already gotten i will share about and hopefully clarify questions um that you have about covid thank you um should i get started yeah yeah madhuri ji okay. go ahead and start it okay, yeah okay okay you see that yeah we can see your screen okay um so my parents are shrinivasu and dakshini uh, actually my dad went to jnu so he is an alumni as well um so i did my training i'm finishing up in montefiore in the bronx in new york um and i did training in connecticut and also uh, uh did my medical school in jersey so i'll talk a little bit Um I'm not going to go into the statistics that much because everybody knows about the, the every day what's happening. Um more about the prevention and uh treatments and the vaccines that we have because those are things that we can really control. So just a little bit about uh COVID it's very similar to MERS and SARS. Um when we had the epidemic um what with MERS and SARS they noticed that it's very similar and um the it initially came from an animal reservoir so it 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 didn't start from the humans it started from animals um and it's called covid-19 because it's called coronavirus disease 2019 and it's uh, we all know that it started in china um it started in december and then the pandemic was declared in march uh, 11th um so how is it really spread uh covid is spread person to person uh with approximately um 6 feet and it it basically anybody who sneezes or coughs even talking you you can produce um droplets so that lands in your mouth and then it lands in the back of your throat and then that can be inhaled into your lungs and then that's how you can get uh covid infection and people without symptoms can also spread it because uh it takes about 2 to 14 days so that's a pretty wide number of days that the covid is sitting in you it's brewing it's having uh it's replicating it's increasing its numbers in your throat so during that time you if you haven't had a cough or sore throat yet you can still cough and you can still sneeze and give it to someone else so what are the symptoms of covid um so fever cough shortness of breath uh sore throat and also loss of sensation of taste and smell um are some of the symptoms and a lot of people can also have diarrhea which is associated with it but more severely you can have pneumonia and respiratory failure and that's those are the severe cases that we're seeing in the hospital um what it starts with the symptoms above but it it can progress to the worst symptoms so it's important to know what type of people are higher risk for this Um so older adults actually are uh, greater than 65 years of age are higher risk for severe illness so the ones that i was talking about pneumonia um like a really bad respiratory failure 
um, requiring hospitalizations. Uh, we are seeing in the U.S. eight out of ten deaths in the U.S. are in this age range, and a lot of the percentage of these eight, eight, 65 to 84, they're requiring hospitalization, and a good chunk of them are requiring to go to the ICU too, and and that's where we're seeing the deaths. So a lot of people who have asthma are also at higher risk because it causes an asthma attack. And when, you're, when your body is under stress with that attack, you can develop pneumonia from that. Other conditions also are affected. Um, obesity is a big one. Um, diabetes, kidney disease, liver disease, um, heart disease, smoking, um, if you have HIV, and, and if you're on steroids for any diseases, these are conditions that uh, put you at risk for a high, like the severe COVID. Um, so these are things, these are people that should take much more precautions. Um, and if, if, and this is more common in the U.S., but we have nursing homes and long care, long-term care facilities, uh, where those residents are more at risk. So how do you prevent it from getting it? Um, so you have to wash your hands at least 20 seconds. I know just washing your hands isn't enough because it doesn't cover all the surfaces of your hand. So you have to wash it for 20 seconds. Um, after going to a public place, uh, blow your nose, um, coughing or sneezing, any of that will we'll try to uh, spread COVID. Try to use soap and water. There's no reason to use hand sanitizer because um, you need at least 60% alcohol and not all hand sanitizer have that high uh, percentage. So you have to check the back of the sanitizer to see if it's um, high enough. And th this can happen when you don't readily have a sink available or if you don't have soap, you can use it, but just make sure. Um, try avoiding touching your eyes, nose and mouth, especially if you haven't washed your hands uh, because that's, that's how COVID gets to the mucous membrane. So including like your eyes um, and mouth, you can inhale um, and that's how you can get it. So avoid uh, sick people, stay home and distance yourself are the other key thing. Um, stock up only on necessary supplies that you need. Um, no need to travel if it's not necessary. So avoiding non-essential travel is important. Um, and call your doctor if you have any symptoms. Um, I have explained the symptoms, but if you feel concerned and you have questions, you should definitely call your doctor. Um, I have a couple of links at the end that I, I will keep mentioning, and most of them are referred to CDC. Um, so just uh, more strategies on how to clean your house and things like that. Um, I get a lot of questions about the face masks, like what should we wear, should we wear it? Um, and it's recommended in uh, public settings. If you, if there's a lot of, even if it's few people outside, um, you, you should be wearing one. Um, it can be homemade. Um, I mean, we're very skilled at making things at home, so it, it doesn't take that much. You can make it in, into cloth. Make sure that it's snug like that picture, that it covers your nose and the bottom of the chin. Um, and then you can put something around your ear loops to help hold it tight. And allow it for breathing because if it's not, uh, if you're con feeling congested or if you feel difficulty breathing, then that the face back is not uh, good. So make sure it's a little bit um, okay for you to breathe, but still covering all, all those parts of your face. Um, you should be able to, if you make it out of cloth, you should be able to wash it. Um, without damaging that shape that you've created. Um, don't wear surgical masks or N95 masks. I mean, the, the me those, those are really for the medical personnel. Um, it, we, are, we have a shortage here. It's getting better and a lot of donations that we're getting for masks. But um, if you have some, I, I know there's areas where they've set up to donate them. Um, so that the, people don't know the proper use of this and um, it's important to not use them because there's still a shortage. And last but not least, like social distancing is important. I know everyone's in home isolation, but that's really preventing because the droplets travel six feet. So just distancing um, is common sense. You, you won't get it. So a little bit about what to do if you have COVID. Um, stay home unless you need medical care. Um, call your doctor in the meantime. Uh, each state actually through Department of Health has a hotline. So you can call the hotline and uh, explain your story and they will guide you to which, who to talk to and separate yourself immediately from your uh, people in the house and including pets. Um, try to have your own space in the house um, and 
just monitor your symptoms. The biggest thing to monitor is fever if you have a thermometer. If not, that's okay. Like you can check, you can feel it every day. Just uh, keep track of how you're feeling. Um, sore throat, cough, shortness of breath, and loss of taste and uh, smell. I'm as I mentioned, you you just monitor if they're getting better, or worse. Um, that those are the reasons to keep track of, and if they're getting worse, to contact. Um, cover your face, especially when you're around people, and stay, stay six feet. These all these apply from what I mentioned before. Um, but when you're home and you're sick, then you shouldn't share any personal household items. You shouldn't share dishes, glasses, cups, uh, utensils, towels, bedding. Like all of those, um, COVID can spread through. Um, clean your hands often, and especially clean high touch surfaces. A lot of people don't know about so phones we use a lot remote control uh, counters tabletops doorknobs are very big uh, bathroom fixtures toilets keyboards and tablets and bedside tables those are things that we use all the time touch all the time put things so like clean those often um, and then one thing i want to mention is um, it's important to stay home if you're sick and do all those precautions but if you have these symptoms you should go to the hospital immediately so if you have difficulty breathing, um, especially if you can't sit up and get up, because pneumonia initially you will feel a little short of breath, but if you can't catch your breath and you can't talk any words, you have to go to the hospital. Um, if you have a pressure or a pain in your chest that's there, it's not going away. Um, if you have confusion and this is something your uh, family members can notice, um, or maybe they call you and you don't sound right, that's that's a huge um, alarm sign and if you have any bluish lips or any blue color in your face uh, you should call um, in the US obviously that's 911 but in India just follow your precautions on getting uh, attention immediately so a little bit about treatment I won't go into uh, too many technical details um, so hydroxychloroquine actually all of this um, if you have mouth symptoms like I mentioned stay home um, but hydroxychloroquine, actually, we did a lot of trials, and this was the regimen that we were recommending before, but there, there is not enough data anymore, and we're not using it for treatment. So we were using this drug. It was used for, it used for malaria, usually, for treatment of that, uh, but we are not uh, recommending it anymore, and it also has a lot of side effects, so if you don't know, uh, if you're not a doctor and you're taking it, you can have um, uh, your heart rhythm can be affected, your liver function can be affected. So um, I would not recommend taking any of these medications anymore. Um, a couple of clinical trials that we have um, and nothing for you guys to know, these are the medications. Um, but the biggest thing that we are doing in the US is the convalescent plasma. And this is probably going to be what we will rely on the most. And uh, just to explain what that is, a uh, person who's infected with COVID on the left, um, they would have recovered and they can uh, go to a blood bank, they donate their blood, and the blood has antibodies and the antibodies can be used, um, which they, they, that body uh, produced initially to fight COVID. So you were using someone else's immune system to either prophylax the people, which I don't think is going to be the stage yet, but therapy uh, for patients who are really sick in the ICU who are admitted in the hospital. Uh, we can benefit from the people who have fought the infection before and try to give it to the people who really need it. Um, these are the criteria for donating. Um, uh, hopefully no one had COVID yet, but if you know or if you want to contribute, so if you've had a positive test, um, if you don't have any other medical problems and uh, age is 19 to 65 years of age, and if it's been at least two weeks since uh, uh, you've had the symptoms. So you need a little bit of time for your body to build that up. And the vaccine, um, right now we're on phase one trial. There's a couple of states that are working on it, Washington, China, Oxford, and Philadelphia and Kansas. Um, everyone's in phase one. Any vaccine that needs to be, that can be given to everybody has to be in phase three. Um, China, I know, recently is entering phase two, uh, and I, I know um, in Europe also they're trying to enter into phase two. So we're not there yet. It's going to take a couple of months, and all of these vaccines are based on SARS and MERS and also other viruses that are similar to COVID. 
So we're trying to be smart as humans to figure out what can we give uh, that's best uh, similar to COVID. Um, that's obviously dead. It's not an active virus that you've given a vaccine. Um, but uh, like I said, we're not expecting that until at least at least um, 2021, like early 2021. So um, stay up to date uh, with your state. Um, that's the most important thing I can recommend because every state is different. I'm in New York. It's um, you know it's crazy here. Our rules are very different from other states. Um, a couple of New York and other states have paired up, and they all come come together to make similar recommendations. Uh, but if you're in a different state, uh, the, those Department of Health might be different. Um, play, uh, you know, take advantage of the hotline if you have questions. Even if you have questions, they're willing to answer. Um, and they're all medical personnel, people who are trained. So get your information from those people. Um, we have, there's a tech service and there's also other things right now that are people being affected by unemployment, um, you know, ways to help. So that's also all on there with your state. Um, and just some final comments. Um, I, I really, really strongly recommend if you don't take anything from this presentation, please take this. Um, rely on you know reliable sources, uh, CDC, Department of Health, doctors, uh, people who are in the medical field are the ones who will give you the right sources. Um, statistics, obviously you can believe anybody. It's numbers, no one's gonna lie about numbers, but um, things to do, things to take precautions from, those are things you should really stick to reliable medical professionals. Um, and, and it's really important that you stop, you know, listening to news all day to figure out what's going on, because that just puts a lot of negativity. So add positivity to your brain, um, catch up with friends and family while you're home, work on your hobbies. You'll never get time like this in our lives to just stay home and do nothing and get paid for. So I, I think this is probably the best time to do all of these things. If you always wanted to exercise or uh, things like that, there's so many uh, opportunities to do that on apps with technology and give back to your community if you can um, in a safe manner um, as much as you can, even if that's helping your neighbors. And, and you know, we're all stronger than this virus. It's not going to kill all of us if we all put our brains together and just stay safe. So. Um, as one of my mentors says, don't just go through the pandemic, uh, grow through the pandemic, um, grow in uh, mental uh, stability, physical stability, any way that you can think of and just come out of it better than uh, you entered it. And these are some uh, links that you can, I can send it over to your group or and you can access and they're all basically from CDC. Um, and there's a couple other information. So. Um, I want to thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak. I hope I answered some uh, essential questions and I see the chat um, with a lot of questions. So I'll, I'll give the give this over to um, Tommy. Tommy. Yeah. yeah, so thank you, Madhuri. I appreciate it. So I know there are a lot of questions are coming in, but I think uh, you have answered most of them. So we'll pause for the questions right now. So we'll go to the panel and then I will come back to these questions once all the three doctors give their presentations. But I appreciate uh, what you have shared so far. Thank you so much. Now, I request uh, Dr. Shanti Ji, who is expert in the pain management and anesthesia to talk about what is um, how she doing in coronavirus and what is the advice she can give it to us. Shanti Ji. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity, Swami Ji and uh, JNT alumni. Uh, I'm uh, I do anesthesia pain management uh, from New Jersey past uh, 20, 25 years. Uh, presently, I do more of uh, outpatient uh, pain management and interventional pain management in New Jersey. So there is a change uh, with all uh, the pandemic going on. So we are doing more of a telemedicine. And I deal with a lot of pain, man pain management patients uh, who uh, have... Uh, lot of, uh, you know, they have a lot of medical conditions, including immunocompromise. So I'm going to just touch base a few minutes on uh, what alternative uh, things uh, can be done to improve your immunity, which was one of your questions uh, in, uh, for this uh, webinar. So uh, the recommendations, there is no hard and fast rule, but these are, have shown increase in the symptoms uh, in the prior studies, which were individual studies. So not just related to this COVID, but it is related to any viral infections. So there is, um, first I'm going to talk about uh, zinc, which is one of uh, essential uh, mineral for uh, immune uh, system. 
It has been shown to decrease the replication of the viruses in vitro studies in the past. So uh, in that sense, it would be a good uh, alternative or uh, a supplemental uh, vitamin for patients uh, and, and also for uh, otherwise healthy ones. I believe everybody should be taking uh, a multivitamin, which has uh, the zinc in it also. So the zinc, the recommended doses is 30 to 40 milligrams per day, which uh, can be taken. And the other one is uh, vitamin C, which also uh, supports the immune uh, cells, which is a powerful antioxidant that also decreases uh, and protects against the damage uh, from the uh, oxidation of stress. So the recommended doses is maximum 2,000, do not take more than, but a lot of uh, 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 fruits have uh, vitamin C, which everybody knows about. So it is better to supplement it uh, with the fresh fruits. But if you were taking a tablet, it's 250 to 1,000 uh, milligrams per day. Would, uh, the other one is uh, vitamin D. A lot of pay, uh, people in the uh, U.S. are uh, deficient, and I'm sure everybody's taking supplements. But uh, daily supplements can be taken in your uh, multivitamins. And then also you can take uh, extra doses if you are deficient. And uh, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions uh, on uh, the, the ibuprofen, taking pain medications uh, in general. Tylenol is what is uh, recommended. If you are taking any medications uh, other than Tylenol, you have to discuss with your uh, physicians. Then there was a misconception on ibuprofen in the uh, in WHO had recommended not to, and then they kind of uh, take a note that uh, uh, restriction. But uh, definitely, if you have any pain, do um, talk to your physicians, and they will give you the proper outcome. So this is what I wanted to talk. I think uh, there were a lot of questions on uh, you know, immune, how do you improve your immunity? And eating fresh, hot food uh, is the best thing. But if you have to take some supplements, uh, these are few of them. Thank you. Over to Sami. Sami, get Sorry, I was on mute. I was talking. So, uh, thank you, Shantiji. I appreciate it. Uh, so, we have a few more questions, but I'll just pause it for now. And uh, again, thanks for uh, letting us know how the situation is in US and what are the things uh, which uh, you are doing here and you are recommending. Now, I will uh, request uh, Dr. Madhavi to talk about how things are in India and, uh, because she is uh, front frontlining almost 200 bed. Uh, COVID patients in uh, Hyderabad. So I want her to give a little bit about uh, the situation. Over to you, Madhuji. Hello. Thank you, Swami, Mr. Swami and uh, JNT alumni for giving me this opportunity <laughs> to participate in global webinar. Uh, so I'm Dr. Madhuri Sattram, working, I'm a senior medical officer in homeopathy and working in the Aish department since the uh, past 18 years. Uh, I have worked uh, and various dispensaries of government of Telangana. And uh, now I'm into the pharmacy department uh, where we are uh, uh, preparing all the homeo medicines and distributing throughout the uh, Telangana state of all central and state uh, dispensaries. So, uh, and uh, I'm, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Madhuriji and Shantiji for giving elaborate discussion on COVID. And uh, you have not left anything about to tell about COVID. And even then, uh, the thing is, I would like to uh, explore you about India. Because uh, uh, India, being the developing country, having uh, uh, second most popular country, all the developed nations, uh, thought that uh, once the COVID enters into the India, we'll see a lot of uh, uh, cases uncured and we'll see most of the um, uh, uh, people dying. But uh, to be surprised, for everyone's surprise, uh, we, have, uh, we were really uh, only the total uh, de the deaths so far is only confirmed cases of 26,917 only. And out of that, uh, deaths are only 826 as of today. And in the, coming to Telangana, it is confirmed the cases have not even crossed the 1,000. And the deaths are only 26. All this, the achievement is just because of the, uh, uh, because of the, our Prime Minister Modi ji. His foresight, uh, he's very beautiful foresight uh, by suspending the uh, international flights. 
through which it is the main root cause of entry of the virus into the India. He has first suspended the all uh, international travels. And second thing is he has implemented this complete lockdown, lockdown of all over India, which it is actually a fight, uh, international uh, uh, fight by the people. People fight of COVID-19. So we have lockdown because of the lockdown and by maintaining the complete social distance, uh, we have implemented, though uh, he has quoted, our prime minister has quoted one beautiful saying, hmm? what is that? Do gaz ki zeruri. Zeruri hai do gaz ki zeruri. So a distance, minimum distance of one meter is maintained by all and the, and the, the most important thing is we are preventing infection prevention control system is beautiful um, beautifully maintained though in developed countries we can see it is all over still the death rate is more there and we have started the beautiful control of infection prevention and we are keeping all the suspects in the isolation centers now we have in india around 3500 isolation centers so but uh, uh, we are utilizing our government is providing utilizing converting all government uh, schools uh, stadiums and railways even railway railways coaches 20000 of railway coaches were converted into medical facility centers so by the, and uh, it is i am proud to say that uh, our government homeopathy hospital in hyderabad is also one of the isolation center having around 200 bed centers and i am i am working with those patients now we are uh, so far we have uh, since uh, uh, establishment of the center we have admitted around 90 patients and only two were positive so far all the patients were negative so we are very really uh, our government is providing uh, dr cm kcr sir and our health minister our Aish director, everybody is taking very much interest in providing good health care in these isolation centers. We are providing very nice, uh, we are uh, making the patients give easy uh, for the sample testing and we are providing immunity booster diet and we are giving good uh, hygienic uh, in infective preventive controlling areas for all these patients. And after receiving the samples, uh, we are sending the patients to the home for the quarantine for 14 days. Uh, and after that, uh, we are uh, the suspects are uh, only positive cases. We are sending to designated COVID hospitals. So we have in India around 35, 52 designated hospitals are there. And in Hyderabad, Gandhi Hospital, I think you all know about it. Gandhi Hospital is one of the famous uh, COVID designated hospital where we are having very beautiful treatment. India, though having though it is in developing state, we are really well equipped with the medical equipment. We are having so many ventilators and all. And in this crisis, our director department of Aish, she is very much interested to know that our homeopathy medicine, arsenic, I think all of you know that by now. So we are giving that in all isolation centers. So we are giving homeopathy as a prophylactic. In fact, in the first case arrived to, uh, where first case was traced in Kerala uh, in the month of, in the end of January itself, we have started uh, giving this prophylactic medicine in all airports. Okay, where, from where the people are coming, because this is from Wuhan, China. So all the international people who are coming from China, we have started first distributing our medicine and we have we are strictly implementing to all the immunity boosting system of uh, developed by the Aish Mantra. Uh, and uh, this is the main reason uh, for uh, not exploring the COVID virus, okay, in India. So currently, as you all know, only uh, these uh, too many, too uh, um, few thousands of cases are there, not lakhs like in developed nations. So this is just because of that. And the one more thing is our government of India has introduced this uh, uh, lifeline udang. Uh, so new system of encouraging uh, the system of uh, through uh, it is taking services through our railways, airways, and postal department to supply medicine to all over the state. As well as we have explored, we have supplied even hydrochloroquine to this antimalarial, the most important drug of uh, um, this uh, COVID-19, as Dr. Madri said, uh, to USA also from India. So that is a great achievement of uh, our uh, Indian government. So all these things 
we are able to do just because of the proper planning okay and uh, the most important uh, thing is as uh, swamiji told immunity booster in your crisis management of this plan uh, the, it is uh, mainly because and our government has introduced arogya setu one of the digital platform where everyone every one of the in all individuals can self test about the uh, situation and uh, there it is there it is giving alerting the patients alerting the people whether they are uh, nearby positives are available or there are not so you all can also download this arogya setu and one more thing is this covid barriers.gov.in this is the digital platform created by our prime minister this is where we are giving help to the needy people from all walks of the life sir we are providing agriculture food we are helping the poor to the we are giving food we are and those who are immigrants who have come in to the from distant places they are unable to go to their original places because of lack of transport and because of the lack of to all these sectors of people we are giving food we are giving helping uh, money and all in all walks of life this is mainly because of this pm national relief fund uh, one uh, this thing is there so all these ways uh, we are able to curb this virus and we hope that by maintaining the social distance uh, uh and we are by following uh, uh, immunity boosters by giving immunity boosters uh, like uh, drinking uh, warm water uh, throughout the day by practicing yoga and exercise every day at least for 30 minutes uh, by using main turmeric cumin coriander and garlic in the food diet uh, by taking herbal teas uh, and uh, you know the golden milk really it is giving very good booster uh, you just uh, you have to keep half teaspoon of turmeric in half uh, 150 ml of hot milk we should boil and filter the milk if you consume that milk uh, it really gives you the good boosting and uh, the one more and last thing is oil pulling this is also giving very, very good result so these are all the immunity boosters we are taking there so uh, these are all the things swami ji Uh, and and um, thank you for giving me this opportunity again <laughs> okay this is the situation at oh. india okay hey bye. bueno adishesh thank you dr madhavi ji appreciate it uh, so what we now request is uh, there are couple of questions i'm going to um, call out and then if anybody one of the doctors uh, can uh, unmute and say that will be good uh, one of the question is as we all talk about uh, social distancing now people are saying in the air it can go up to 8 meters this virus can spread so is that true that means is the social distancing has to be increased more than uh, uh, the 6 feet uh, there is a question from our participants uh, maybe madhuri ji can you answer that yeah i can answer that so um i i don't think that's true um we have not had any studies that are done that tested this uh we don't we haven't seen that in the hospital because if that's the case then we would have to have every patient in the hospital 8 meters apart um <laughs> and that's not possible in the US or India so <laughs> um it, it the patients who have covid we are isolating them in a separate room and they and we are using precautions um uh, one thing I'll mention is um in the hospital we can do procedures like intubation um or testing that uh where we put a swab in the nose and you can generate uh droplets that are much smaller than when you cough those can stay in the air and travel farther um but that's only done in the hospital when we're taking isolation precautions in the hospital so that's not really relevant to anything outside so outside we only worry about people coughing uh talking and uh uh sneezing and that only travels 6 feet thank you madhuri ji yeah. another question is should we worry as corona being more asymptomatic so how do we really know because we have to quarantine 2 to 14 days then only people will know so people may be lot of people are transponders in the community so is there any way we can really identify how do we deal with it as asymptomatic system so if that's the that's the part that we don't know there's no way to tell if you have it or not if you're asymptomatic if you don't have symptoms you don't have symptoms and we don't know okay. it's just like anybody else um what you can do is just you know take the prevention precautions and if you start even feeling any symptom then that's the second that you isolate yourself um but as long as you're following precautions that means that you're not spreading what you already had um and if you um if you came in contact with someone who's sick 
then that's also another, you know, like be even more precautious about your symptoms and uh, what you're touching and what you're feeling. So yes, there's really no way to know. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Madhuri. And question to you, Dr. Shanti ji. Uh, uh, not, even though you are a specialist in pain management, I want to ask you one question. How do we take care of these vegetables? Because people are having a lot of questions, okay, we are going out to the groceries, but how do we really make sure these vegetables are clean? Because I am hearing stories, they're putting soaking in the surf water for a day. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, this is my uh, input on that. Um, it's uh, usually, the, it is, uh, the virus is on surfaces for a few hours. So what uh, we are doing here is uh, we are, when, the thing is it can be on plastic, the ones you bring the groceries, it can be on the cardboard, whatever is being delivered. So we're keeping it out for a few hours and then bringing it in. Now you can wash the vegetables in lukewarm water and uh, you can use it. You, can, uh, you don't have to soap it, but you can use uh, mild, uh, you can uh, clean it with uh, mild vinegar, but mostly it is warm, lukewarm water should be good. Okay, thank you Shantiji. So I have a couple more questions now to Dr. Madhavi and then Dr. Uh, our uh, attorney Janita will be coming to you. Um, so thanks for everybody patient. I know there are so many questions are coming and there are a lot of contact details people are asking. So we'll be sharing this uh, recorded video. All the information is good. Everybody is excited. Everybody is also very anxious about this corona. So we'll definitely be sharing a lot of information. So a couple of questions to you, Dr. Madhavi. Now, um, yes, yes. Uh, uh, this arsenic call, how effective is it? People are asking, the, can we take this as a preventive or is it more uh, after the effect? Or can you please give us uh, information on this arsenic call? Yes, uh, the Central Council of Research in Hyderabad in India, uh, they have done uh, several research uh, techniques on this uh, and they have found actually, uh, they have found, really found arsenic alb is very good as a prophylactic medicine and uh, many, uh, you all know the symptoms, the initial symptoms are uh, mild cough, cold and uh, uh, tiredness, aches and all. Moreover, the anxiety is more in these COVID patients, whether even if you get or not, uh, the people are really worried with the anxiety and all. And these are all the symptoms which is going for this arsenic alb. Definitely, uh, uh, in Gujarat, uh, in India, we have really, they made a testing uh, in uh, quarantine patients by giving uh, uh, these test as a test in this COVID. Uh, really, they got improved all uh, uh, except nine cases. Uh, all those admitted around uh, 130 patients on, they, on whom they have tested, uh, except nine patients, that also those who have not taken the doses properly, all other patients got negative. So definitely this arsenic album is giving good result and we re really do recommend this medicine as a uh, prophylactic and preventive medicine for COVID. Okay. Thank you. And the one more question and the last question for the doctors right now is, um, um, in the travel to India, I know right now there are travel restrictions. So any information you have, if somebody wants to travel to India, they are going to be still quarantined even after the travel restrictions. Any information you have? Yes, uh, we definitely do a quarantine. So that is the way we can restrict the chain of uh, COVID-19 to spread. So so even if uh, the people, the uh, thing what happened actually, even this uh, pandemic uh, uh, was about to, uh, in the negative states coming down, but the people who went to uh, Ma, uh, to Suraj, some place up in uh, Delhi, uh, to they went to some uh, uh, mask. Uh, they there they got attacked this way, these things, uh, and they have uh, uh, hidden the history of travel. If you do like that, really it will be spreading to all. Once we have the history of travel, and it is definitely because of this travel history, we people are uh, contacting with uh, spreading this virus to others. So one should do quarantine. So that this, this is the reason we are even after getting the results negative in our isolation centers also, we are providing IEC materials to the public, to the people who got negative reports and we are advising them to go for the home quarantine. In the home quarantine, what they all should do, how they all should maintain the hygiene, how they all should be, we are giving some educating guidelines for them by giving some materials and they are asking them to, uh, to go for home quarantine. So quarantine is a definite thing. Uh, 
maintain the social distance, uh, keeping away from the public to avoid the, this thing. Uh, so stay home and stay happy is the slogan of the day. Okay, thank you. Oh, the, I really appreciate it. So because of the time, uh, I want you all to stay here. We'll come back to some more questions. But I request now Janita ji talk about uh, the current scenario on the employment and the labor laws and the visa. Their people are really in panic mode, anxiety, all the people in US. So over to you, Janita ji. Yeah, thank you. And uh, especially special thanks to all three doctors on the panel. Uh, really, you know, uh, thanks for sharing that wonderful information. And special thanks to JNTU Alumni Association for putting this webinar together. Uh, I'm, I'm Janeta Kancharla. I practice immigration law in Washington, D.C. Past, practicing past uh, 11 years. So, you know, when we talk about immigration, you know, always, you know, most of the t most of our folks have a basic, uh, you know, uh, information or, you know, what's coming on, you know, what kind of rules are there, especially when we look into the uh, current proclamation that was signed by, you know, President Trump. Uh, you know, most of the non-immigrant visas are not really affected. Only, you know, immigrant visas and that to only certain portion uh, uh, of people were, you know, um, restricting. So one is, you know, those who don't have any of the immigrant visas uh, as um, per the proclamation day and then don't have a proper documentation, you know, uh, those who are not really eligible to enter into the United States. But at the same time, they uh, also, you know, uh, gave certain exemptions to this uh, particular, you know, proclamation rule. So the exemptions are, you know, uh, the green card holders, those who are right now outside the country. Once the travel, you know, resumes back, you know, definitely you guys can travel. Uh, the other uh, would be uh, the nurses, you know, the physicians and, you know, all the other healthcare professionals and their spouses and children are exempted from this pro proclamation. And then the EB-5 investor visas are exempted. The reason would be uh, because they come and invest inside the country, which is you know, boosting the economy and at the same time creating you know, uh, those kind of jobs, uh, adding to the economy. So they are exempted. And then uh, uh, US armed forces and their spouses and also uh, the uh, certain special immigrant categories like, you know, the Iraqis and the Afghanis who helped the U.S. government, you know, them and their spouses and, you know, the national interest and things like that. These are the uh, certain categories that were exempted in the proclamation. So when coming back to the H-1B, you know, I mean, before this proclamation was signed by the president, uh, everybody, you know, went back into a panic mode on that Monday evening as soon as president tweeted that, you know, I mean, I'm going to sign an executive order because when we, um, you know, uh, scale back and then see, uh, he did really uh, did a travel ban in 2018 where, you know, um, uh, kind of banning uh, people from, you know, uh, those seven to eight Muslim countries and then supreme it, the case went all the way to the Supreme Court because a lot of organizations, you know, uh, the civil organizations challenged it. But of course, you know, the Supreme Court upheld that case, you know, from five to four rule saying that, yes, president do have that kind of authority to take the, to do the executive order banning those kind of, uh, you know, countries, uh, the people entering into the country because it's the best interest of the, um, you know, the president took uh, that kind of decision in the best interest of the country. So this executive order also stemmed and, you know, that Supreme Court case is a little bit boost to, you know, uh, implementing this executive order. But, you know, I mean, unlike what was predicted, you know, I mean, everybody are at ease, especially because a lot of people inside the country are working on H1s, you know, Ls, and people are here on B1 visas and then, you know, on R1s, and then temporarily visiting, you know, a lot of parents here and especially students here. So these are all non immigrant visas. So, you know, definitely these people are, you know, a little bit uh, relieved after, you know, uh, looking into the details of this uh, proclamation. So, people, those who are on the H1Bs, no need to worry because the H-1B extensions are going as usual, you know, uh, six months ahead of time. Uh, you know, one is eligible to do the extensions that is going on because the USCIS, United States Immigration, um, United States Citizenship and Immigration Services are still open. All the service centers are working. And uh, when we contrast that one to the local uh, field offices, so those were closed because, you know, they are following the CDC guidelines. 
and then uh, those were closed as of yesterday you know the date was uh, the date is uh, june 3rd so the local field offices are going to open up from june 4th so people those who um, have scheduled you know uh, naturalization um, interviews or oath ceremonies or some people you know uh, have to go back to doing the biometrics and things like that you know they can start doing it as per the information that you will further receive from the uh, field offices but of course you know good news is the service centers are open and you know cases as usual the h1b's are extensions transfers and amendments are ongoing and then you know the l extensions you know those were all ongoing and i think you know the f1 as because of the covid effect the consulates um you know uh, outside are you know closed because of this uh, covid so anyway i think you know once things uh, you know scale back and re you know resume it to uh, normal so people can you know i think will get the information from the consulates you know to appear at the uh, visa and then but you know we could see some delays on those lines depending upon how quickly uh, each part of that uh, you know geographically how um each state or you know city will respond back by really maintaining you know that social distancing and then you know i mean um uscis is still working so i would take some questions right now so if anybody yeah. has any yeah thank you bharti ji and janata ji and i really appreciate the information i think a couple of questions i have from the participant one of the main question is the employment right so the employment they have been um, so they lost the job already so there is a financial hardship and then h1b is also cancelled so technically they are out of status but because of the travel restrictions they cannot even go back so are they really considered any out of status is there any immigration implications so what do you suggest what they should be doing now i think they really uh, should be carefully drafting whatever the evidence that they have you know like when they lost the job and then you know, the reason of that and then especially if they are you know in from indian origin they can say that you know how the country is in lockdown from certain date no arrival departure of, from the airlines so they can document it very well and then you know most likely once they have the job you know they uh their further adjudication on the h1b would be without an i94 very technically sending them back to the home country for the visa appearance again but you know please document it very carefully and then you know uh when you appear at the consulate you know for the visa please present them with all these scenarios you know i mean if you have any document you, you can always print it from the state department so since when the india is on the lockdown of course when the airlines are not running you know there is no way for a person to go back so that will be a good reasoning and then of course you know i mean uh, the consulate official you know who is interviewing the officer will you know buy that argument so for now temporarily of course you know if you uh, lose the job you know there is a financial crunch you know i definitely agree that is you know we are we all are going through hard times but uh, you know i mean keep faith and then you know uh, hope and then we'll move forward and then economy will come back but uh, you know as i said uh, have all the documentation in place along with the evidence and then the most important thing is when you go back uh, for the visa stamping uh, please be prepared to you know i mean uh, verbally communicating with the officer not just throwing some papers at him and then saying you know hey look at just you know explain that you know hey this is what the situation of course the officer will be knowing it but if it is coming out of you that you know explaining that you know they definitely know that you are very well prepared for it and then you know along with the evidences excellent and one more question is in this h1b are they still doing the uh, you know extension of the h1b's or transferring of h1b's and uh, are there any timeline impacts on form filing and green card filing anything on the time delays and transfer of h1b uh we don't see any time delays on those lines because you know the service centers are you know uh, working so you know all the h1b transfers amendments and the extensions are you know it's like business as usual so and then um especially when coming back to you know the delays and all uh there is a no uh, announcement from the uscis uh, for the cap h1b this year they we could see some delays like you know in the may first week or second week you know a little bit delay in issuing the receipt notices i guess because of the uh, you know um the staff or you know um, the lack of staff that they have 
And uh, we also received another, you know, uh, communication from the USCIS recently that because of the case load, they are transferring several petitions to one service center to the another service center, which is not unusual uh, within the United. I mean, with this USCIS service centers, um, you know, that is you know ongoing. Uh, regarding perm and all, you know, I don't see any delays because, you know, our office in and out dealing with, you know, getting the advertisement codes, you know, newspapers are working as usual. So, you know, going ahead. But one, um, uh, one red flag in there would be I would, you know, uh, um, you know, bring it to employers' attention is, you know, because there is a heavy job loss right now. And then, you know, a lot of unemployment is going on. If you're trying to test the market conditions right now, you probably might receive, receive more resumes. So no, if, that is, if that is going on and then, you know, we, I definitely, um, from my personal side, my opinion would be, you might see, you know, more audits on those lines because, you know, uh, if you say that I never received any resumes, that's, I know highly likely it's an, you know uh, not a true statement. So you know the audits might go up definitely on those green card filings. That were that's what we are. Excellent. Thank you, um, Bharatiji. I think you know immigration is one interesting topic. There are many questions are there. So I will ask you last question and then we'll communicate. And the next we'll give it to Govardhanji. I know it is in India a little bit late, but you be prepared. So last question to you, uh, Janitaji is. Uh, what is the impact on uh, especially somebody coming from India as a visitor? If I want to sponsor my mom or somebody, how do they impact? Because some of these uh, dates have been postponed. So that is the question from the participants. So can you touch on that as a last question? Yeah, especially for that question, you know, if the application is already, you know, it can be done in two ways. You know, if the parent is inside the country, it's like, you know, filing the immigrant petition and the adjustment of status together. That's not affected in any way if the parent is outside the country. So, you know, uh, putting up the application with one of the service center, you can still do that. So, you know, it is taking around in you know, six to eight months or even more. That process is still going on. But especially if the dates are like, you know, if the petition is approved, the immigrant petition is approved and the dates are not available at the consulate. And then right now, because of this proclamation, that is one impact you can see. And of course, this proclamation is only for 60 days. But of course, at the same time, it is also an open-ended one where, you know, President said that, um, you know, based upon the um, DHS and then Labor Department and uh, Secretary of, uh, Secretaries of the Department of State, all the secretaries, you know, rec based on their recommendations, he might even go further. But for right now, it's only 60 days. So anyways, because the consulates are not working right now, so that is one delay. You could see those delays. But temporarily, I would say, you know, 60 to 90 day on these delays. But once uh, the consulates and this proclamation after it expired 60 days and the consulates reopen. So, if, of course, you know, the mom can go to the consulate and then, you know, come back. Excellent. Thank you, Janitaji. Appreciate it again. So maybe stick around. There may be a lot of questions again later, if possible, and then we'll communicate. But uh, stick around. Thank you so much. Now, as we know, you know, first is our health. Now it's all about what is my job loss economy. Now, okay, now I've decided I have to go back to India. So there are a lot of kids are stuck here who have to go to the college. So we are really looking forward for you, Rector Govardhanji, Professor. So if you can give some information about how this NRS can uh, apply and what is the process, especially people are worried about the timeline. So if you can give some insights about it, I will be helpful. Thank you and over to you. Yeah, you can start. Yeah, uh, namaste to all. Uh, can you share the uh, PPTs or you want me to share? Yeah, you, you can share. Yeah. Yeah, we can see your screen. Uh, can you uh, can you, you can, can you see, see my screen? screen? Yeah. yeah, you can see the screen. You can go ahead. Start. Yeah. I'm just looking at the slide show.
Can you see me, sir? Right? Yeah, so can, yeah. can I go ahead? Yeah, yeah please go so, ahead. Yeah, namaste to all. Uh, uh, very good evening uh, from India. And I think it is a morning there. So uh, this is in connection with the, you know, uh, particularly uh, with regard to the admissions in India and particularly in Telangana, state of Telangana. And uh, as uh, the theme goes, uh, particularly for the NRIs, uh, what are the admission prospects that we have in uh, state of Telangana uh, with regard to the engineering admissions? And uh, we have, as per the AICT All India Council for Technical Education uh, norms, uh, we have 5% quota for the NRI students. Uh, Govardhan, and, uh, uh, your screen uh, uh, is visible, but I think it is showing uh, a different slide. Is, are you in the same, correct slide? Or? Yes, check uh, slide mode. It's not in the slide. Okay, let me just check. Can you see the first slide, sir? First slide is visible. Maybe I can uh, share one second. Yes. You are sharing a different screen. If you have multiple screens, you are sharing a different screen to the Zoom. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll just check. So I'm sharing the screen, Gaurdanji, so maybe it's yeah, yeah. Okay, can everybody see the first screen? First slide? Yep. So Gaurdanji, you can talk. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Yeah, you can, you can go to next slide, sir. Second yeah. slide. Yeah, so this is uh, particularly in the context of the NRIs. Uh, there is a 5% provision. Uh, based on the number of seats that institute, uh, any institute offers. Uh, let's say if there are uh, 60 seats uh, in a particular branch, then we'll have uh, five seats for the NRI quota. And uh, based on any typical uh, situation, if you look at any college, there are uh, conventional five branches we have, computer science and engineering, um, electronics and communications engineering, electrical and electronics uh, engineering, then mechanical, uh, engineering and civil engineering. These are the normal five conventional branches most of the colleges offer. In addition to that, you also have the branches like information technology, electronics and telecommunications, uh, like number of uh, other branches are also available, but these, these are the most commonly offered branches by the uh, almost all the institutions. So, so this uh, normally the practice of this uh, uh, NRI admission is we have our uh, Telangana State Council of Higher Education, uh, which is the uh, on top of all universities, which coordinates the uh, entire set of universities on behalf of the government. And uh, this uh, State Council of Higher Education issues the notification to all the colleges, stating that you go ahead with the NRI admissions. And uh, this is the uh, beginning date, and this is the cutoff date. And uh, after this cutoff date, you have a processing procedure uh, norms have to be followed as per the AICT guidelines. So this NRI seats uh, particularly uh, reserved for NRIs. And if the NRI seats uh, are not filled by the true NRIs, then we have a quota of 15%. Uh, in 15%, we have the foreign nationals, uh, persons of Indian origin, and CIWG, that is children of Indian workers in Gulf. So these are the three uh, different categories. See, if you look at the 100% quota, out of 100%, 70% quota is for uh, convener quota. So that is based on the MSET, which is the common entrance test conducted across the state. The 70% of the seats go through this MSET admission process, which is done by the convener admissions. And for the remaining 30% of seats, out of 30%, again, 15% of that, that is 50% if you take, it is uh, it comes to 15%, is exclusively for the management quota. So the management are free to generally exercise their own uh, choice to the extent possible, but it is also, there is a norm and guideline stating that you have to follow the merit order. 
metadata to be followed even for that 15%. And the remaining 15%, as I said, there are three categories, each will have 5% out of that, right? So NRI has a 5% quota of the number of seats based on the number of sections that we have, right? So the general norms that we have eligibility is that uh, should have passed the qualifying examination or it's equivalent uh, with not less than 50% marks in uh, physics, chemistry, and mathematics are its uh, equivalent. Uh, put 50% uh, aggregate. That is one norm. And second is, uh, if it is a CGPA system, then it should be uh, equivalent to five in a scale of one to 10. Right, sir? So the student should, not, uh, should be an NRA whose mother or father is, uh, can you just go back? The, the other uh, uh, guidelines. If you are comfortable with yeah. that, then I will go to. So, uh, uh, NRA candidate means candidate born to a parent of Indian origin residing outside the country. So this is the norm uh, that generally we follow as an NRA uh, candidature treatment. Uh, go to the next slide, sir. Yeah, so the documents required uh, when somebody wants to take the admission under this NRI quota, uh, then these are the certain things uh, uh, required. See, uh, once uh, uh, when you are trying to apply for that, then proof of remittance of the tuition fee and complete application form along with the receipt of the registration fee, then uh, if you have a uh, MSET, so that wherever it is applicable, then uh, intermediate are plus two marks and uh, language version along with the translated version. So if somebody is not from the English language also, there is a translation uh, certificate required, uh, duly attested by the Minister of Higher Education or concerned embassy. Then a mark sheet and pass certificate of secondary school certificate and uh, school bona fide certificates from sixth to uh, 12th class, then uh, transfer certificate and uh, community or nativity certificate, if any, then uh, equivalent certificate issued by the Board of Intermediate Education. So that is normally applied to the Board of Intermediate Education once uh, you know the equivalence part is to be applied. So then accordingly, the, this certificate is given. And when it comes to the NRI uh, you know, uh, proof, then employment letter from the parent, the current placement of employment should be taken and uh, valid visa should also be uh, uh, given. And uh, then we have uh, the passport, Passport is the other uh, one, sir. Uh, then go to the next one, next slide. Then uh, there is also a provision for some, in some of the cases, uh, if the uh, NRI is not the true NRI, there is also a provision of the sponsorship possible. Then if, if sponsorship is there, then uh, corresponding sponsorship letter should also be there. And uh, then employment letter from the current place of employment, then valid visa, passport and passport size photographs along with two stamp size photographs and uh, if somebody has uh, you know appeared for these any of the examinations like JEE or other uh, uh, related examinations then two sets of all pages of uh, passport of the candidate including the empty pages so these are the documental uh, requirements <coughs> which are to be uh, submitted sir I'll go to the next slide sir so <coughs> The eligibility part when it comes, as I mentioned, the institutions that are appeared by All India Council for Technical Education, the approval body is the AICTA, and they will uh, allow the NRI seats not exceeding 15%, as I said, uh, the combination of three categories, and uh, the qualifying mark should be not less than 50% of the marks. And uh, whenever there is, a, there is a kind of uh, tie comes, Tie comes when the you know uh, when the uh, applications are more than the number of uh, seats available. So under some such circumstances, uh, the order of merit and the criteria that is taken to see that you know who will get the admission as per the uh, guidelines and the procedures laid. Go to the next slide, sir. Uh, yeah, this is the uh, merit list separately uh, prepared for them. Uh, NRI is the first priority given under NRI quota. And if somebody is not coming, let's say that there are uh, five seats, but only four applications are there. So there is a one seat vacant. So in that case, those who appear for JE mains are, uh, if they, the candidates are available from JE mains, then that candidate is given the priority. If there is no candidate, then it goes to the next level. Uh, that is M set. And even if there are no candidates uh, who got uh, passed through M set, 
then it will go to the percentage of marks in the prescribed group subjects taken together as we mentioned like you no know, mpc maths physics and chemistry are the aggregate of the qualifying examination even the plus 2 level aggregate uh, of that is also uh, taken into uh, consideration right sir so i leave the slides with you so absolutely so this is uh, with regard to the admission procedure in the jain to hyderabad sir the, which one uh, earlier one which i mentioned was uh, if you look at the uh, telangana state we have around 200 and uh, or if you look at uh, engineering colleges alone we have 160 engineering colleges and whatever the regulations i mentioned they are applicable for the Uh, affiliated colleges they are called affiliated colleges and in each college you have around uh, uh, 400 and or um, uh, 300 college uh, 300 uh, seats possible right so in each uh, uh, college you can see at least 300 colleges uh, 300 seats available so from that perspective if you look at uh, uh, 5% of uh, 300 it comes to uh, 15 seats 15 seats per college Uh, taking all branches together you have that so if you look at on an average we have uh, around 80000 uh, seats in all the affiliated colleges if you take the 5% of that it will come to around 4000 4000 seats uh, all branches to put together when it comes to university that is either jntu or usmani university we also have offer different programs and uh, these are the programs under foreign uh, you know students and foreign nationals we offer offer undergraduate program we also have the integrated uh, dual degree program then we have masters program then master of computer applications then uh, masters of uh, business administration then m pharmacy uh, msc so these are the other programs which are being offered uh, but the procedure that we follow for this uh, university university is will uh, call for the applications uh, not like our state council state council is meant for all the affiliated colleges and when it comes to the university under the guide, guidance and direction of the state council we separately issue the uh, notification for calling the applications from the candidates so then uh, these are the procedures that we follow though we have different units in our uh, university again there are seven Uh, different academic units one of them is the college of engineering hyderabad similarly we have school of management studies for mba we have institute of science and technology which offers uh, uh, masters programs then we also have school of information technology which offers uh, masters programs in computer science and uh, information technology so like that we have uh, seven different academic units and uh, we'll process the uh, applications uh, in a centralized way so we don't uh, ask for the applications individually for each institution so applications are to be submitted to the university in then university will process them and accordingly as per the choice of the candidate they are uh, further forwarded to the respective units of the uh, university so that is the general procedure that we follow sir uh, can you go to the next slide next slide sir yeah so this is uh, the general uh, procedure as i mentioned uh, we have 15% uh, total put together foreign nationals pios and uh, ciwg out of which 5% is for uh, nri quota uh, we also follow the same norms again as far as the admission process is concerned in the university college uh, admissions also and uh, whenever there are no uh, candidates from one of the three categories they can internal be adjusted let's say there are um, uh, foreign nationals are less then it can be adjusted so total put together is 15% and if there are individually 5% is not available so they can be adjusted within so something is 3% let's say then uh, uh, remaining 12% can be adjusted with the other two categories so that's how it goes and these three can be internally adjusted with 15% next slide sir so this is the general uh, procedure as i mentioned when we call for the applications the applications have to be submitted to directorate of university foreign relations this is the directorate uh, which is uh, uh, with the university and generally for the application submission is uh, 200 usd 
and uh, we also give the uh, you know notification date and the cutoff date by which the applications have to be submitted normally the general time is at least one month time is given in a typical scenario uh, it generally comes in the month of uh, march or april and uh, the submission date would be uh, sometime uh, at the end of may or sometime in, in the month of june so normal commencement of the class work for the uh, first year student is uh, august 1st so in any case not later than august 1st is the uh, commencement date uh, for the first year students but because of the present uh, situation and the lockdown so it may get extended by uh, one and a half months as of now uh, because of the various you know circumstances and uh, various uh, uh, statutory body, um, you know, guidelines going on. There are number of committees constituted. Uh, uh, when is the next academic year uh, beginning? Uh, as of now, people say that you know, so sometime in the uh, first week of September is for the commencement of the uh, you know classwork for this academic year. That is 2020, uh, 2021. So as per that, uh, we we may be able to. Uh, if this is apl applicable in case of you know masters and also for the research programs, uh, we also have the provision for taking the admissions for the candidates uh, who are of uh, foreign nationals or NRI. Uh, we also offer the uh, masters programs and also uh, PhD research programs under uh, various units that we have in the uh, university, sir. Can you go to next slide, sir? So when it comes to the uh, Let's go to the next slide. Uh, when it comes to the affiliated colleges, as I mentioned, uh, all the affiliated colleges will call for the applications separately, individually from the respective colleges. All the colleges will give the notification uh, through their website and they will call for the applications. They will also give the cutoff date. Most of the times the cutoff date is almost the common for all the uh, institutions and uh, applications can be separate, uh, submitted individually. It is not uh, like in a centralized way what we do, but when you want to have the admission in a particular college like College X, then you'll have to submit the application for College X. If you want to have the admission for College Y, then you'll have to separate, uh, submit the application separately to that college. So based on, the, based on your choice in which you want to take your admission, accordingly you'll have to uh, submit uh, your application through uh, through their you know website. So normally it is uh, the online application uh, is accepted uh, along with the you know the application fee, and they will also give the uh, respective dates like you know when the list will be processed and uh, when the list will be displayed uh, uh, like the selected candidates, and accordingly will be able to uh, know whether you got the admission in that particular. Uh, institute or not so typically uh, uh, if you look at uh, uh, telangana scenario as i mentioned we have around 230 colleges out of which uh, uh, we can say around uh, 80 colleges are in and around uh, uh, twin cities within the uh, within the you know uh, vicinity of uh, uh, let us say uh, 30 30 kilometers 30 to 40 kilometers then you find around 80 colleges and you can find i would also provide some links and other material uh, maybe sometime later in this i'll share those things in the group um, some of the top 25 to 30 colleges i'll, I'll be able to tell you besides the uh, university colleges like jntu uh, college and uspania uh, besides these two university colleges we, i would also be happy to share with you uh, the other uh, some of the other uh, top colleges uh, that exist in and around uh, Hyderabad. Okay. So typically, uh, as I mentioned, uh, if you just go through the uh, particular college website, uh, you would be able to understand, you know, the the kind of uh, provisions that are given, uh, the dates and other things. But generally, uh, it uh, it happens sometime in the month of April and closes uh, sometime in the month of uh, June, but because of the current uh, pandemic situation, uh, it will get delayed by uh, one to one and a half months. So now it is uh, we are in the month of April. Uh, sometime if once this lockdown 
uh, situation gets some clarity because we have the lockdown in uh, state of Telangana till 7th May. And once we get the clarity on that, whether the lockdown would be extended or there would be a relaxation, uh, relaxation of the lockdown, accordingly, the other course of action will also take place. So, Gordanji, thank you for the information. So, a couple of questions are popping up. I think you touched on uh, timelines. So, what yeah. is the best way to go and check the timelines? Because a lot of the people are here. So, they want to yes, check yes. the process. So, can they start the application process now or they need to wait for the application? Because, because now, now, as of now, there is, there is no, uh, you know, initiation from the state council. Unless there is a direction from the state council, the college will not initiate the process. Okay. So I, I would be able to share uh, the you know uh, dates from time to time. Once okay. we get some communication mm. uh, from the higher levels, then I would also uh, share the share such details with you, like in the, either in the group or through the mails. Sure. Uh, what are the dates given? Like where, when the application uh, uh, submission of the application will start and when it would close, and when would be the you know display of the. Uh, successful candidates. So, so while we get yeah. for the timeline, so do you advise uh, students to do anything, any other paperwork, anything they need to do? Because technically, here all the schools are closed in US. So they are all at home. Everything is online. There is nothing is going on. Schools have declared holidays for the rest of the year. So they just want to say, do they need to communicate or get any kind of a paperwork from their schools and be ready when the timelines or application opens uh, at your place? Yes, yes. As I mentioned, uh, I have given some list of documents to be submitted, even when the application is to be submitted. Okay. You also see that no, those documents are made ready. So okay. if the documents are not available, then they can also approach the uh, their uh, you know either schools or colleges, uh, so that uh, you know meanwhile they can prepare their uh, all the documents that are required uh, to see that they become eligible to submit the applications. Excellent. Excellent. So thank you. I know I think it is a little bit uh, over time, but I think it is a very, very informative session. Again, uh, I thank you so much, Govardhanji. There is a lot of information you have provided. So I'll be sharing that information to the respective thank parents who are really looking forward. In the time to time, uh, share with us the links and other timelines. And yes. again, uh, thanks to all the doctors. I really appreciate for sharing the great uh, depth of information. And thank you, Janitaji. I now request Hariji to do a closing march and this is our first uh, uh, JN2 alumni US uh, webinar and I'm very happy to say we have crossed almost 80 people. So I really appreciate for everybody coming and sticking with us on a Sunday evening from various parts of the world. And uh, Hariji, uh, back to you. Yes. Please give a Thank closing. you. Thank you very much, Swami. It's a wonderful session you have uh, moderated. Uh, appreciate your services and we'll work with you. And uh, Dr. Madhuri, thank you so much for taking the time off uh, from your busy schedule today on a Sunday morning. And Dr. Shanti and Dr. Madhavi and uh, Janeta from Washington, DC. Thank you so much, Professor Govardhan. It's a late for you, but I appreciate your detailed presentation and we look forward to working with you to encourage our uh, NRIs to get into JNTU to start with. Let's see what happens. Uh, be safe wherever you are. And we have a few people from the uh, JNTU alumni on the call. I would like to introduce uh, Professor um, Brahmara, uh, is the coordinator of um, Alumni Association. And uh, also I have uh, President uh, S. Vijay Mohan Rao for Alumni Association of JNTU is also on the call. And we have uh, Jaker, Vice President, JNTU Alumni Association. Uh, wonderful to see you, all of you. And we will have uh, some of the sessions moving forward. Uh, I hope they are all useful, informative, and we will get some uh, good speakers also line up uh, based on this uh, different topics. We will include them as needed, uh, timely, and encourage everybody to attend these sessions. And our goal is to bring all the JNT alumni together to support uh, back in India uh, to establish uh, one center for uh, alumni association and also uh, provide some uh, ongoing lectures and any ad additional support in the research and development. And uh, those are the kind of things we are planning for. And Dr. Vijay, do you want to say any few words? Hi, everyone. Uh, this is a very good session and uh, it is informative and a very excellent session. I hope, Hari, in future also we will have a, this type of sessions regularly so that the alumni of our uh, college uh, it will be helpful to all the alumni and uh, please take care of the NRI activities vigorously there 
Uh, actually, we had a session. Hello. Yeah, we good. Go ahead, please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. We can hear. Yeah. We thought of installation uh, in the month of June, but because of unfortunately this coronavirus, maybe I don't know that you have, you have to take care of all these things. So anyway, this time we we hope this type of sessions will be very good for our alumni. Once again, I'm stressing you, and uh, we'll hope uh, within a month one more session like this. Thank you, Professor Gordon sir, for your deta in detail admission uh, criteria process for the benefit of the students. And also, I thank Dr. Madhavi, Madhuri Tirmandas, Dr. Shanti Ipanapalli, and also I appreciate uh, Mr. Uh, moderator, uh, uh, Swami, he has conducted a very good session. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijay. And we have our Professor um, Brahmara. She is an excellent. Uh, work for the alumni association coordinating from the college point of view. Please share a couple of words if you can. Uh, hello, good evening all. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a really a great effort by the USA chapter of uh, JNTUHCH alumni association. And you have really put together uh, uh, very uh, panelists from diverse fields. Uh, Professor Govardhan sir from education and uh, uh, one from uh, law and one from uh, uh, Indian side, uh, one from the uh, uh, Western side uh, in the medical field. We have put together all of them and the, we, we are all hugely benefited by this session. Uh, I hope the USA chapter will take many more such initiatives for the benefit of all of us. Uh, thank you, Harigaru. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I have uh, Jaikar, Vice President uh, of the JNT Alumni Association. J Jaikar, if you can say a couple of words. Looks like uh, we lost him. So anyway, thank you so much and uh, wonderful. Be safe, stay home. Uh, whatever we can assist, please feel free to communicate to us. We'll be happy to provide additional information. And Swami will share this recording to everybody's benefit and we will communicate back to you when we host the next session. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Yeah, thank, thank you. you all. Have thank a wonderful you. rest of the thank evening. You. Good night to you all. Thank, thank, you. thank, you. thank you. Thank you. No hello, only namastes to all. <laughs> thank you. Namaste all. Thank you guys.